is the word of God. I'll tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal put on immortality, then it shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. We've been looking into the future resurrection of the believer for a while. Uh, resurrection in Jesus Christ here in this chapter, chapter 15, long chapter for us. And uh, last Sunday I said we saw this perishable, dishonorable, weak body, but we received, we reap imperishable, glorious, and powerful body in the resurrection. As the Paul says here in today's text, once again, at the beginning part, let's look at verse 50. I'll tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood, this flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Perishable body cannot inherit the imperishable kingdom. Flesh and blood cannot. We need to get new type of a body. And let me remind you, last week I said, the eschatological body and the life in the kingdom was actually promised to Adam from the beginning in the Garden of Eden based on our condition of his trust and obedience. By Adam's disobedience, it was lost, but the Son, the Son Jesus, appeared and offered trust and obedience to God the Father, even through the suffering, even on the death on the cross, and he regained the promised kingdom and the life and the body through his resurrection as a second Adam. Now today, we are asking these two questions about two endings. The end of your life and the end of this world. What will happen to us at death? And what will happen on the last day of the world? Your end, my end, and the end of this world. We will look into these two, and then I will draw a short application at the end. Okay? First, number one, what will happen to us at our death when we die? And I said this last Lord's Day. The ultimate cause of death is the departure of the soul from the body. All the other medical diagnoses, such as heart stopping and on and on, they are physical observations we can make on this reality that is hidden, that is spiritual, that is beyond our visible sight. We see that. But what happens at death is the soul departing from the body. And you know, at death, our body is left. We see it right there, and we bury the body. But what happens to the soul then? That leaves the body. Westminster Shorter Catechism, we go through Westminster Shorter Catechism in our worship service, and we are not there yet, but number 37, well summarized, well captured, well explained the teachings of the Bible on this. So let me read it first to you, and then I will try to unpack it. Question number 37, it says, what benefits? Give your mental note right there. What benefits? Do believers receive from Christ at death? We get benefit when we die? Death? Answer. 
the souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory and their bodies, these bodies being still united to Christ, do rest, the body will rest in the graves until the resurrection. So the body is still part of us, who I am, it rests, but soul, this is what's going to happen to the soul. So number one thing I see here. The souls of believers will be made into a perfect holiness at the moment of death, not later, when we die. Now let it be clear to you. Christ Jesus destroyed the reign and the power of sin through his work. So the reality for Christian, this is if you are a Christian, this is your reality. Your reality is that your inner being is free from the reign and the power of sin. But we still retain the sinful fallen nature in the flesh, in the body. This flesh is still stained by the sin. The remnant of the sinful desire is what we experience in life. That is why our Christian life is a constant battle. It's a war against the flesh. Against the flesh. We need to discipline it. We need to keep it under control as Paul says in other place. In our inner being, we delight in the law of God. We delight in God's will. We want to be holy. We want to be godly. We want to live life in obedience to God. But we constantly face the urges and the weakness of the flesh. And there's a war is going on within me, within you. So Apostle Paul says, even the apostles confess this way, Romans chapter 7. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. I want to obey God. I love His way. But I see in my members, in other words, members mean body. Another law weighs in war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Paul was struggling between the two in my inner being. I love God. In my flesh, I'm still experiencing the stain of sin, the remnant of sin. At death, the soul departing from the body, free from this corrupted nature, and completely sanctified. And secondly, immediately the soul of a believer will go into the glory and to be with the Lord. Some heretic groups like Jehovah's Witness and others, so and so, they say, at death, we all going to fall into a sleep. In other words, we're going to be unconscious in the intermediate period from your death until the last day, the judgment day. During that time, you'll be unconscious. The next thing you realize, you wake up and you are at the last day of the world. No. The soul of a Christian will go to the dwelling place of God immediately at the moment of death. Let me show you. Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, I am hard-pressed between the, the two. Now, one, my desire is to depart this body and be with who? Christ. For that is because that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. It is good for you, for your sake, than me being here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, while we are in the body, body as a home, then we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from this body, leave this body, depart this body, and at home with the Lord. All these passages are referring to the intermediate state or period between your death and the last day. Body will be clearly buried to the ground. 
which is expressed in the Bible as fall asleep. The body is still you. It's falling asleep. But until the resurrection, it will rest there. But the soul will enjoy all the presence and blessedness of the Lord the meanwhile. It is so for the dead, for unbelievers too. Meaning, the souls of unbelievers will not be in unconscious in their intermediate state or period. The next thing they wake up is end of the world. No. The souls of unbelievers will be in a place called Hade. In the Old Testament language, Sheol, the realm of the dead. And he or she will suffer until the last day of judgment. And this we can see from the parable of Jesus, the parable of rich man and Lazarus, and other passages in the Bible too. So at the last day of judgment, the whole place of Hade and the devil and all unforgiven sinners will be thrown into the lake of fire, the hell, as their eternal destination. I remember my one, uh, one day the conversation with my child. As much as I can, I try to tell Bible story to my kids as their bedtime stories. Um, first, I make them hey, pray individually first, so they pray on their bed. And when they're done, I read from the Bible. Uh, I play the dramatic music with my phone, and I eliminate it. I mean, I dramatically tell the Bible story. So, they, like, you know, I try to do that. And they're listening on their bed. And one time, I was reading from the book of Acts chapter 20. It's, you Probably it is a well-known story to you. It was about this young man, Eutychus, who was sitting at the window listening to the Paul's preaching. He fell asleep. He fell from the window and he died and was brought back to life. And I was telling them that story because I was going through the book of Acts with them. And after that story died, my son said, Dad, I'm scared of death. What if he hurts so much? I know that I'll have resurrection on the last day when Jesus comes back, but what will, what's going to happen to me when I die? I'm scared. Dial, son, Jesus will never leave you alone. Your death will never happen to you apart from your Savior, your shepherd, Jesus, who loves you, who cares for you. You will never die apart from his care. And actually, you know what? We will never die. Only the body will. It's going to be like you taking off your cloth called the body. You know, when you come home, you take off all the dirty cloth, you change it, that's what's going to happen. You will take it off. Yes, it may be painful, For short, but it's going to be quick. It's going to be short. It's not going to last long. It's like you entering through another door. And next thing you know, immediately you will see the glorious kingdom of God. And you will be able to see Jesus face to face and enjoying all his sweetness and you will rest with him. And you will wait for the resurrection on the last day. You know, we are waiting for the resurrection of this body, right? But the souls of believers in heaven, they are also waiting for the last day resurrection to receive the glorious and powerful body. Son, think about it. I get excited when I think about it, what we can do in the body, in the new heaven and new earth that God will bring after the resurrection, when he makes everything new. I want to do this, I want to do that. I say, I want to go into the middle of the ocean, I want to dive, I want to climb up to the highest place, and I can do all without any fear. It's going to be so much fun. Son, think, if this fallen world This world is cursed by God because of our sin. This world is broken because of sin. But even this world, so many things are to many degrees still beautiful. Still we love many things, we enjoy many things. But how much more then in the new heaven and new earth that God has prepared for His children? 
we will praise God because so fun, so many things are great and awesome, and He who made them all is far greater. Suddenly, my son got up from his bed. He got all excited. Hey, he started to talk about, I want to do this, I want to do that. No more fear of death. Every child needs to know about this as well. Our hope beyond this life and death. The promise of God in Jesus Christ on what they will be like on that day. Young children slowly realize of their own brokenness, of their own limitations. They experience them. And comparing with other kids and say, what's wrong with me? And they try to find their worth in many things about themselves. But they need to be able to see the hope and what they are going to be like in Christ Jesus on that day. Your worth and who you really are is right now hidden, hidden in Christ. But on that day when you get resurrected and glorified, it will shine visibly that you are a child of God the Most High. It will show. So they get confidence. Not, hear me, not self-esteem that is rooted in themselves. Their worth in themselves. No, Christ is them. They find their worth in Christ. Verse 55 of our text. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. Verse 55. So we say, or death, where is your victory? Or death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who can say it like this? Not only death to us became like a scorpion with its sting removed. Imagine a scorpion with its sting removed. What is dead anymore? But guess what death is like to us? Let me turn your attention to Revelation 14. Now death, this is what death is to Christian in Christ. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead. Did you hear that? Blessed. They are blessed. Dead people are blessed. Who die in the lower from now on. Blessed indeed, it says, repeating again, emphasizing, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit says it, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. You see there? The dead are blessed, not cursed. Oh, dead people, they are cursed, died, they died. No, blessed, blessed indeed, because they died in Christ. Because Jesus changed our, even our death to be our blessing to enter the eternal rest in Jesus Christ. And they will never, ever suffer again. Death is not the end of us. Thanks be to God who gave us victory in Christ Jesus. Even the death of the saints a blessing. Your family member, your loved one who died in Christ, don't think they are cursed. Do not think they are rejected by God. They are blessed in the Lord. Number two, what will happen to us then on the day of Christ's return, on the last day? What's going to happen? Let's look at 51 of our texts. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Are you there? Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, that's first, and the dead will be raised imperishable, that's second, and we shall be changed, that's third. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on the immortality. So one... 
there will be a trumpet sound. The universal signal of the crisis descending with power and glory. Two, the resurrection of the dead first, after that. Three, after the resurrection of the dead first, the Christians, those who are still alive at that time, will be transformed, changed. Four, that resurrection and glorification, that change will happen, boom, like that, in the twinkling of an eye, immediately. Fifth, both believers and unbelievers, and you know, they will all stand before the judgment seat. All will be resurrected. All will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and to their eternal destination. Now, notice this. So far, what I just said, and some of you may say, I know that. I know that. But did you notice? Did you know this? I want you to notice this part here. Our glorification into this imperishable, glorious, powerful body, glory, that will happen to us at the trumpet sound of his return. And you're like, wow, what's the big deal about that? Well, I'm saying we all will be changed immediately in the twinkling of an eye when not after the judgment, but prior to judgment. Not when you are judged. And you know what? I think you are now, I think you are righteous. Now you can be glorified. Now you can have eternal life. Now you can have a new body. No. We will stand before the holy judge of the universe as already justified, forgiven, already sanctified, holy, already glorified state. Before we stand at the judgment, we are already glorified. We don't even stand before the Lord yet. At the trumpet sound, when He comes, boom, we're going to be changed. Do you get this? Why is that? Because of what Christ has done for us and who we are already in Jesus Christ. Already. The judgment will be an open acknowledgement, reaffirmation of our status and identity in Christ. I think Westminster showed the catechism once again, recaptured this very well. Number 38, it says this, what benefits? Now, you remember the benefit we get at death, even death? At our death, we get benefit. Now, what benefit we get at the last day, the judgment? Do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? Answer. At the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory first, shall be openly acknowledged, acquitted in the day of the judgment and may perfectly bless in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. The judgment will be only openly acknowledging, acquitting, reaffirming of your status in Christ. Now, some of the Thessalonica church believers did not know this. So when some of their members died, the rest were grieving so much for them because they thought Jesus will return in their time and people who died, our members who died before Jesus comes back, they failed to make it into the kingdom of God. They lost it. So they were grieving. So Paul said in the letter, look at this letter, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers. I don't want you to be ignorant of this. About those who are asleep, in other words, those who are dead that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even so, through Jesus, God will bring, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, that God will bring those who are dead with Christ. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. This is not my idea. This is not my expectation. This is a message, word from the Lord. Right? That we who are alive, 
who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, for the Lord will himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's going to happen first. And verse 17, And those we who are alive until that day, who are left, will be cut up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now you see the event, how it's going to happen. Now some Christians, some people came up with the theology of rapture from this text. Some of you probably heard about the rapture before. The word rapture, the word itself means snatch away. Snatch away. Because it says here, those who are still alive until that day, they will be cut up to the air. Snatched up, raptured. So they say, the second coming of Christ will be done in two phases. Maybe some of you heard this, learned this, believed in this way. That one is his secret coming in the air. Invisible coming. And he will snatch out his people out of the world. So suddenly, from all over the world, true Christians will disappear. They will get raptured. And they will go to heaven. So while one was driving, one was cooking, one was eating, one was working, one was sleeping, and boom, gone. Which implies the massive number of people disappearing from this world And you can imagine what it's going to be like if the one Christian is a pilot or driving, then the accidents, the chaos the world will face. Where did they go? People disappeared. And they said, that is the beginning of the seven-year great tribulations of the last day. And after the seven years since then, after seven years, Christ will return now. And that time, he will come back visibly. This will be his second, second coming. Second part of his second coming. And the last judgment will happen. I mean, good Christians. I know many Christians who believe this from this text. And I'm going to argue against that. This has not been the historical position of the church, Christian church. In 1833, this whole Theology of Rapture began 1833, not that long, by a person named John Nelson Darby. He came up with this interpretation. And since that, it became very popular and spread all over. Especially, it became very popular in American Christianity. And then it went, exported into the other countries as well, due to the Books and the movies and the medias, like, you know, the Left Behind series. I don't know if you heard about it before or not. I do not think that is a correct interpretation because many assumptions are forced into that theory which the Bible does not speak. First, in our text of Thessalonica, what we just read, the trumpet sounds first and the dead will be raised. Before they are alive, those who are still alive until that time, being snatched up, cut up, raptured up to the air. What happens first? Trumpet, resurrection of the dead happens first. We see the same thing exactly in our Corinthians 15 text, verse 52. Look at verse 52. You see the exact in that order. Now, we need to understand what the trumpet sound is associated with in the scripture. I know we are going through many, reading many passages. Stay with me. Let me turn your attention to Matthew 24. Jesus said this about the rough slave. This is what Jesus says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the power of heavens will be shaken. Now this, this describes the fall of this created order. 
then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, Christ Jesus. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see, all people will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. This is what? Visible return the coming of Christ. Not a secret one, not invisible one, but His coming. To the all before all people's eyes. Verse 31. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from four from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So God at the sun will collect all his people. Now no one knows when this is gonna be. And he will come suddenly, unexpected. But that does not mean that it's going to be a secret one. This is going to be a very, very visible one. Coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, gathering all his people from four corners of the earth. All, the whole world will see it and no one will be able to hide from this. And it it accompanies the trumpet sound. Of the archangel. So what they call as a rapture is not an event prior to the last day, but it is an event of the last day. That's what happened on the last day. Secondly, there is no place in the Bible that talks about the two second comings of Christ, two phases, one sacred one and the other the second second comings. No. Thirdly, then why Paul says in this way, I don't want you to understand this, what that passage meant. Those who are alive being cut up to the air, to be lifted up to the air and meet the Lord is an expression that these people can understand living in the Roman world. Now, When the Roman army, led by the emperor or a famous general, went out for a conquest campaign, a war, and successful one. And when they returned back to the city of Rome, they sent a messenger ahead of them that the army, Victor, is returning. Then the city removed all the dirty things, homeless people away, and all the clean, and they cleaned the city. They get ready, prepare for a party, for feast, and they decorate the city with flowers and all that. You probably seen something like that in a movie. They have decorated the city, and they wait, and there will be outside of the city a sound of the trumpet signaled by the army that the army has arrived. Then the Roman citizen went out of the city to meet the victor and welcome the victor into the city. That's the picture we get. The return of the victorious one, Jesus Christ, the King. And those who are alive at that time will be cut up to the air to meet and to welcome the King in honor. And they will come down, descend with Christ for the last judgment. Just like when an important guest, significant guest comes to your house, you go out, meet Welcome the guests and come into your house. That's the picture we get. All this will be what will happen on the last day at the end of the world at his return. Now let me end with this. I'm done. Now you know the end of all. Your end. Your death. What's going to happen there? And the end of this world. What's going to happen there? And let me give you a short application for us. With the same encouragement that Paul gives at the end of this long chapter of 15 of resurrection. Would you turn to that? Verse 58. That's going to be an application point for us. Therefore, conclusion. My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that In the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Paul said previously in verse 31, he said, I die every day. 
to you. Every day we are trying to put to death our ego, our sinful desire, our flesh. We are battling. We believers give up many things in this life for Christ. We endure tribulations and hardships and suffering. We are God's children, but we go through the sufferings while we are still doing good. We labor, we labor, and we seek not our ways, not what we want, but His ways. And Paul encourages you today in this way. All those things, Christians, they are not in vain. Every suffering that God grants you, they are not meaningless. Every battle that you wage against your fleshly desire, they are not in vain. Know that and preach that to yourself today. That my today, this day, is not a meaningless day. Your today has eternal meaning and purpose. It is not a vain day. When the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, your Shepherd, appears, your price, He will reward you. So, be steadfast, endure, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let's pray.